We welcome you to the Rural FASD Support Network Speaker Series. We are thrilled today to have Catherine Thompson join us. Catherine has been working with our organization here for, I'm going to say, at least four or five months, I think now, uh, in terms of the first introduction that we had with her. She has been absolutely instrumental in helping us understand the four pillars that uh, our organization really focuses on. And it was through her work and our discussions that she shared with us another research project that uh, she had worked on previously. And we thought it is extremely applicable for students with FASD, for caregivers to be aware about. It was something I was not aware of. And so we are absolutely thrilled to have Catherine join us today and we will turn it over to you at this point. Well, thank you very much, Rob. And I have to say it's uh, truly been a pleasure to, to work with you and your uh, group. And um, I'm very, very happy to be here with you this morning. So uh, Rob has been so kind to ask me to share with you the research that I've done to self-advocacy and I have to say this presentation is a little bit different from those that I usually do on self-advocacy. Those are usually from a purely academic standpoint. But Rob and I have discussed that it might be of interest as to the why and the how that I developed my research in the way that I did. So today I'll be sharing with you not only my study and what I found, but also why it came to be that I actually ended up doing research and why self-advocacy was one of the things that I looked at in particular. So as you saw in my biography, the uh, I'm now semi-retired and I've had a, a pretty varied career, uh, primarily in the uh, area of research and evaluation. And that's mostly been in the health sector, particularly in child and youth mental health. Um, so however, my academic career as well as my professional career actually started later in life. I became a mature student when my children were younger and I went back to school as a mature student and then entered into graduate studies when they became older. So my research into self-advocacy is actually part of a larger body of study, which revolved around my graduate studies research with student experience in secondary schools. So my first study looked at out-of-school suspensions in high schools and the student experience of that. And the second study, which still is currently in writing, focuses on student perception of their personal support networks in their everyday environment with a particular focus on supports in schools and where they see them there. So as you saw from my biography, my role as parent and parent advocate has always been the most important one to me. And this is actually reflected in my research choices. So that's grounded in my personal experience as a parent and a parent advocate. And the reason why I was led to these areas of interest comes from my own personal experience as a parent and a parent advocate, seeing my son struggles with mental health challenges, particularly in the school system. And that's informed much of the work that I have done and primarily why the focus is on the school system. So, so the, in fact, my son was one of the main consultants in the development of my research, as well as the development of the self-advocacy efficacy scale. So unfortunately, he did pass away before the research was completed, but his memory and the memory of the challenges he faced are still pretty much in the background. So why this particular issue? And I have to say it's always been particularly puzzling to me how I could see and interpret my son's challenges in one way, while it appeared to be perceived in an entirely different way by others. So some had seen him as lazy and unmotivated while I saw a bright, sensitive, caring boy who was really struggling and increasingly more frustrated and depressed. So this disconnect between what one person sees as opposed to another person's perspective 
as you will see, drives the reasoning behind what I studied in my research. And that was to personally understand, but also address in some way this disconnect in perceptions. So ultimately, though, it became apparent that what was important was actually not my perspective, but what was the perspective of the student? So in light of this realization, questionnaires for these studies were developed to hopefully reveal the student experience and the student point of view. So why self-advocacy efficacy? So my research in self-advocacy and school resilience actually started with my very first research project. And that research involved a skill building exercise in, uh, to help increase help-seeking behavior in the classroom. And this was a group of special education students in a grade six classroom that were given training and appropriately asking the classroom teacher for assistance during math lessons. So what I learned beside the fact that grade six math is hard, and I don't really remember it being that hard when I was in grade six, was that what comes naturally to some, that is in this case, the ability to ask for help, uh, may not come naturally to others. And so on the bright side, studies tell us that it's a skill that can be learned and developed at any age, that there are steps that one can learn to successfully ask for help. As well, not only is there learning to ask for help, it's necessary to learn to ask for help appropriately. So knowing what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. For instance, recognizing when the teacher has time available and not to interrupt when they are occupied with other things. So self-advocacy can be considered an extension of self rather an extension of help seeking. So self-advocacy is commonly referred to as speaking up for yourself and the ability to communicate what your needs are. So it's a social interaction that requires self-awareness that includes an understanding of one's own strengths and weaknesses, knowing what kinds of supports might help and being able to communicate those needs to others. So social skills and communication skills. And at the higher level of this interaction is also being able to effectively communicate or negotiate one's own interests, desires, needs, and rights. So basically, self-advocacy is essentially three things. Understanding their needs, strengths, and weaknesses, knowing what kind of supports might help, and communicating those needs, and to take that a step further, also being able to communicate beliefs and opinions to others. And these may be reflective of feelings. So the belief that they are not only listened to, but heard as well as what they believe in and that they, and that reflective of the expression of what they are feeling is pretty important. And this is consistent with the definition that self-advocacy is an individual's ability to effectively convey negotiators assert his or her own interests, desires, needs, and rights. I would imagine we can all think of scenarios both inside and outside of the classroom where these types of interactions do take place and are important. So the third underlying concept of self-advocacy efficacy in the scale is self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is a belief in one's ability to do something. So it focuses on how the individual perceives their own ability to achieve a specific task or goal. And according to Bandura, the father of self-efficacy, uh, self-efficacy beliefs are developed and strengthened through experience and reflective thought. So more specifically, their belief on how well they do something comes from that experience of actually mastering that skill seeing how others do it and verbal and social encouragement and support. So as you can see, these three concepts form the foundation for the self-efficacy scale. So why measure it? Well, measuring something actually gives us the ability to see it. And it gives us that ability to see things that others might not otherwise see. 
So on terms of self-advocacy, we can break it down by item and see at what point of that social interaction of advocating for oneself, it's positively reinforced or may present as a barrier. And the scale measures student perception of their ability to advocate for themselves. So the student self-advocacy efficacy scale, it was a concept that I knew I wanted to include in my study. However, a search of the literature didn't find a scale that would address general student self-efficacy in the classroom. So it was a gap that I wanted to fill. So the student self-advocacy efficacy scale was developed to explore that dimension of self-advocacy efficacy within the classroom. So the scale looks at student perception of their ability to advocate for themselves in the classroom. And prior to the scale being taken into the schools, it actually went through a number of stages of development. And it was pilot tested with a group of young people as well as school administrators. And these six items were the end result of that process. So after the results were in from the studies, the scale then went through a series of analysis to prove that it did what it was actually supposed to do. So item analysis found it to be reliable and that it appears to measure what it was supposed to measure. And when an analysis was done on how well the scale performed, it was found that the self-advocacy efficacy scale appeared to be a valid indicator of the students' perceptions of their ability to speak up for themselves in the classroom. So as for the individual items themselves, the first item I know when to ask the teacher for help was related to the self-awareness piece of one's own circumstances and knowing that there's a reason and a purpose to ask for help. So do they know what they need to ask? The, what, what do they know what their need is when they need to ask for help? So the second item, I can pick the right time to talk to the teacher was about timing and situational awareness. So knowing when to appropriately approach the teacher and picking the right time to talk to the teacher. And then the fourth and the fifth items were centered around having the words, the language and communication and conversation skills to not only know which words to use, but also the ability to get one's point across. So being able to explain oneself effectively. So knowing what to say when speaking with the teachers, but not only that, also their belief that they can explain themselves well to most of their teachers. So I know what to say when I speak with my teachers and I can explain myself well to most of my teachers. And then the last two items are more of a reflection on the other side of the interaction. So uh, we've covered the ability to speak up for oneself. And now the fifth item covers the other side of the equation, the belief that the student has been heard and listened to. So I can get my teachers to help me when I have a problem. And this is an acknowledgement that they believe that they've been heard, that it was effective by getting assistance. So do they think that they can have these, this support as a result of this interaction? and they can get the teacher to help them when they do have a problem. Then finally, the sixth item, I can successfully communicate my opinion to my teachers, addresses their belief that they can be heard when successfully communicating an opinion. And an opinion is more than just asking for assistance, but it's also an acknowledgement of their personal belief that may actually be reflective of their feelings. And when these are successfully accomplished, they speak to a positive reinforcement of behavior with a perception of positive interactions. So what would be the relevance and importance associated with um, the self being able to self advocate successfully in the classroom? So to speak up for oneself there. And why measure it? So why 
Am I interested in measurement? So measurement is actually a way of seeing things. And if done accurately and thoughtfully, it can be a way of making things apparent that we may not otherwise see. So a way of making the invisible more visible. So what did we see when the study was done? Well, it was clear that the self-advocacy efficacy scale could be a pretty useful means to look at how students perceive their classroom interactions and that self-advocacy appears to do, be a social interaction as well as a learning strategy. Also, self-advocacy efficacy was found to be related to a number of student and school related characteristics. So in the study of student experience of suspensions, it was found that the students had been suspended one or more times, were less likely to believe in their ability to self-advocate. So once suspended and multiply suspended students were more likely to have a lower perception of their ability to ask for assistance and successfully communicate their needs and opinions in the classroom. And the study found that self-advocacy was found to be descriptive of a student perception of their ability to be successful and accepted in an academic environment. So across studies, students who reported higher levels of mental health were also more likely to report higher scores for their belief in their ability to advocate for themselves in the classroom. And self-advocacy efficacy was found to be associated with not only a student perception of their mental health, but also physical health, as well as a number of school-related and academic outcomes. So it was found to be associated with hope, teacher support, school connectedness, and academic achievement, as well as attendance with students who reported missing school because of suspensions or other disciplinary actions, or because they were feeling depressed, stressed, or angry. A mediation analysis also found that student self-advocacy efficacy could be considered one of the factors for clarifying the relationship between teacher support and academic outcomes. How can this knowledge be helpful? Well, this information can be useful considering the number of academic and intervention programs that require students to initiate the process and the increasing recognition of the importance of student voice in the school. So it can be useful for programs requiring students to initiate help seeking or when navigating their way through the academic environment. And it can also offer insights into the barriers and challenges that students face in access of accessing supports and resources. And it recognizes the importance of student voice and tapping into how students perceive things. So when I was thinking about doing this research and the next steps, I was reflecting on the bridges and barriers to accessing help and being able to self-advocate success successfully. So in thinking about being able to do this self-advocacy, I was also thinking further about this gap in perception between what I see and what other people see. And it's kind of like that blue dress, gold dress test from a few years back. Only this is in terms of how we perceive others and may see, see situations differently. And I was thinking about this while on the subway in Toronto when going to school there, and I came up with an analogy. So I scribbled it down on the back of an envelope that I had taken out of my purse and fleshed it out a bit since then. So hopefully it will help to provide a means to reflect on how one person can see a situation completely different than another and a way of reflecting on how we can perceive things differently, but still be well-meaning because I truly believe that people come from a good place and do want to be helpful. How there can be bridges and barriers that may not be readily visible to one, but may be obvious to another. So this is what I wrote down. So it was a bright sunny day and the sun was beating down. Great day, thought the young man. 
looking forward to meeting with his mentor. He was starting to feel like good things were finally starting to come his way. The young man approached the riverside looking across the water divide at his mentor who was standing there with an ice cream cone in each hand. The water was raging by loud and tumultuous. We were supposed to meet, thought the young man, but how am I to get across this raging river to where he is? What is he doing over there? I thought we were supposed to meet by the river, but he's on the other side. So the young man stood there puzzled, wondering what to do. And across the river, he saw his mentor holding up the ice cream cone and gesturing for him to cross. So how am I supposed to do that, he thought. There's the river here. What, he expects me to fly across? Is he joking around? What's he doing over there? So the young man looked across to see that his mentor was starting to look upset and was waving his hands around with the ice cream starting to drip down his arms. He couldn't hear what he was saying because of the loud noise of the water, but knew it couldn't be good. The young man shot an angry look across the river and gestured blindly to the now clearly agitated mentor across the river. What does he want from me, he thought. How can he expect me to get across there? Then his mentor threw one of the ice cream cones away, looked to mutter something, and walked off, clearly upset. Oh man, the young man thought, I really screwed up this time and it's all going to come down on me. His feelings of optimism were replaced by a feeling of frustration and confusion. And he looked away, never seeing the water level footbridge that spanned the river, but not visible to him because of the bright sunshine's shimmer on the water that made it all but invisible on his side of the river. So that's the end of my presentation this morning, and I hope you found this to be helpful. And it was a real pleasure to share this time with you this morning and to be able to share with you uh, a bit about my research journey and how that has come to be focused on student experience and self-advocacy in particular, and why I have pursued this area of interest. Thank you so much, Catherine. This was, uh, like I said before, I have really been looking forward to hearing this presentation and, and all of the information. What you've shared with us here is just so incredibly valuable for really all of our kiddos and, and, and the folks that we have here in the organization. I know that uh, even uh, the folks that this is a topic of conversation that comes up a lot. Uh, just in terms of how do we advocate effectively, particularly in the school setting, um, being able to equip our own children to do so uh, and to have a tool like this that really fleshes out exactly the, the components that are needed. I, when, I, when I looked at your presentation, the one that really jumped out the most for me is the way you broke down the three parts of the self-efficacy versus the self-advocacy versus the behaviors and realizing that you have to have all three of those components in place in order to be able to really truly um, uh, be effective and successful at your own self-advocacy. So uh, this is wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us here today. And once again, to our to our audience, we are thankful and thrilled to have you join us. Uh, once again, we will be back on next month. Next month, we are uh, anticipating um, Dana and Carol from the Ontario Health Council will be joining us and releasing the caregiver guide related to transitional planning. So we hope to see you next month for that presentation as well. Well, thank you very much, Rob.